now specifically. Uh, this is where I live. Um, I mean, working from home and everything. Um, yeah, so let's let's get to it. Uh, a short introduction here. Like Malaki has said, my name is Cheti Mwanza. I'm, I'm working on dropping the name Charles, by the way. I, I want to be African through and through. Uh, I'm a interior designer. <laughs> yeah, I, I really just want to be African through and through. Cheti means the person who sticks through tough situations. So, I mean, I'm proud of that name. Mwanza is my dad's name. Um, I'm an interior designer, like Sam said. I have a master's design from the University of Master in De Master's in Design and a bachelor's in design from the University of Nairobi, both. As far as work is concerned, I work for A Plus Interiors Limited from 2015 up to now. I've worked for Space Concepts Limited from 2013 to 2015. It's a company we had founded with a few friends of mine. I my first job uh, right after graduating from college, like just a week after PINAP actually, was Design Forty Limited, 2011 to 2013. I've also uh, done a few lecturing gigs, teaching gigs. Technical University, that's where I am currently from last year, 2019. In 2015, 2016, I was a part-time lecturer at the Eagleton University. In 2015, I was assisting one Collins Makunda at the University of Nairobi. I was there for one semester. Uh, yeah, and actually, I, I, I'm glad for, for this because that's where, I, that's how A plus was founded, really. Like, Collins gave me this class, it was a second year class. And after I taught, I was teaching instrumental drawing, which I, I think I articulated very well. Uh, yeah, so let, let me first appreciate Collins for, for giving me the opportunity. Collins Makunda is, I, I hope now he's a doctor. He was doing his PhD at the time. So yeah, then after, after teaching this, this class, the student asked me, you know, where can I get an internship? I gave them a list of funds where they could apply. Some of them applied, some of them got, some of them never got. Then they asked him, Molimo, you know, we are going for a long holiday. What are we going to do? So I just thought and, just sat and thought, you know, the, con the, the company I was working for, had, we had just broken off. A space concept had just broken off. So I said, you know what? Let's convert the class to an office. And come and work for me. I'm giving, giving you an internship. So that's how we started. Uh, from 2015 uh, up to present, four years, 10 months, we have uh, presence in uh, the 254, six staff here in Kenya. We have setting up a satellite office in Kampala, Uganda. We have one staff over there. Uh, we hope to like fully set up, I mean, uh, by the end of the year, Corona really just hit us a bit on, on that, on, on the progress for the setting up of our office. But you know, all in all, we thank God. We practice in corporate, retail, residential, hospitality and healthcare, the interiors. We've won some awards. I've just put two here. One of it is from the core awards. Uh, we, we are the top interior design firm uh, currently. <laughs> Uh, according to core awards. <laughs> uh, we, last year, we, we were awarded the fastest growing interior design firm by Real Estate Excellence Awards. Yeah, so that's, that's about A plus interiors. So today, uh, I'm honored to talk about the design process. Um, I cannot talk about the design process without making reference to this book that I came across many years ago. It's called The Interior Design Visual Presentation by Maureen Mitton. It discusses the design process, the interior design process uh, there uh, inside. It's actually the second, the second chapter. If, if, if you get an opportunity to go online and download this book the, on Amazon, I think that you can also get a PDF version just online. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, you, you can just go ahead and do that. I have also to, I, I must make some mentions to some special people if I don't do this, I'll be a sellout, a complete sellout. One of them is Dr. Lilac Osanjo, clap, 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 Dr. Lilac. She's the one who introduced me to the design process in 2010 in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a classroom, in a, in a third year classroom. And, you know, at the time this was being introduced, I could not understand, you know, what Lilac was saying. I, you know, I couldn't understand fully, like 100% what she was saying. But come 2012, 
one year into my employment is when I got to understand this from my former boss, Jackson Devo, that you know, these are the steps that you take, blah, blah, blah. The, ad the, the advantage of that was the company does design and build. So you're able to see everything from start to finish. So that is the, the sense of design and build, uh, the process, including uh, design, including build. Uh, Wamboy Murago, who is a member of this uh, association, also now came to talk to me through the design process from, um, from a consultant's point of view. That is 2013, I was seated somewhere with uh, Mr. Levy Morgan and blah, blah, blah. We've kept on improving this process uh, up to this moment. And so what I'm going to share right now is, is a refined, refined process that we have been working on since 2013 when Madame Wamboy Murago sat us up in some master's class and took us through this. And, and, and you know, we thought she was talking some really foreign things. So here it is. It's as simple as it's displayed on your screen. It's, the design process is a five stage, it's just a five stage process, really. Uh, five stages. Stage number one being programming and pre-design stage. Stage, step number two or stage number two is the schematic prelim or preliminary design stage. Stage number three is called design development. Stage number four is called construction documentation. Stage number five is called construction administration. You can call it implementation. You can call it supervision. You can call it Django. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but that's the last stage. You hand over the job, the client gets to their space and boom, 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 you get your final payment. So let's dissect this from stage number one, programming. So what, what really is this programming pre-design stage? So I've taken a sample project that we did last year, September. It's an office project, a tiny architect office project at uh, Galeria Mall in, in Karen. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, that mall. Um, yeah, so it, it was a, actually it's not Galeria, it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a building opposite Galeria. It's a Cavillenia building where there is AAR, the next is another bigger mall coming up, uh, I've forgotten the name. Uh, it's a sort of a Cavillenia building and so our client was taking space here. So the first stage, once, once you get to, 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 you get a job, an interior design job is normally the client brings a brief so you can take the brief in the in the space that is going to be designed or the brief can be taken uh, somewhere in some in some hotel in some cafeteria whatever but ideally that's that's the beginning of the process like the client has to describe what they want to achieve with their space they have to say where it is what they want to set up what kind of spaces they want to have, uh, what, um, what, what, you know, the square, square meters of the space, nini, nini, their aspirations, what they want to do in the future and everything. And as a designer, you have to write that down as a client's brief. And then after that, you have to find a way of articulating this. You cannot articulate a client's brief without visiting the site. So the second task is normally to visit the site, go and check out what it is, uh, where it is, uh, look at the climate conditions, uh, sun path, look at lighting. Like, you know, here we are looking at, you know, how light is coming into the space, the current flow finish, what partitions are there currently, because you may think of demolishing. So you're looking at the site conditions really. Those are the tasks. And then you're also looking at specialized needs. Like for instance, if you want to create access for people with disabilities, if you want to uh, put ACs, you want to, you know, there are rooms that you need them to have some artificial light because they can't get natural light and all those things. And also just, they can't get, uh, they are not ventilated well enough. So you have to use artificial ventilation, blah, blah, blah. So many things you look at, um, like if you see my sketch over here, I've highlighted the points where there, is, there are lights, I've highlighted the ceiling heights, height to window, window height, I've shown where there are columns, I've shown what is a window, what is a wall, like you are just sort of taking, taking up uh, what you find on site. So that's the pre-design stage. And what is required at this stage is you write 
uh, the brief notes. Take down the brief notes. You can write on a piece of paper, that, but it's advised that you go to your office and type them. Type these notes and send to your client for them to confirm whether what they said is actually what you recorded so that you may have an agreement from the word go. Like, you may be on the same page from the word go. The other thing is to take side photos. These are for your consumption, really. The survey layout is for your consumption. And there's a demolition plan. I'll show you what, what a demolition plan is. And then, you know, all clients normally ask this question. They ask, they ask you, roughly, how much will it cost me to do this job? You get. So you have to have the skill and the mindset to be able to just come up with a rough estimate just by looking at the square meters of the space and by looking at the client brief. Uh, that is something that you cannot learn in school. That is something that you have to acquire over years. But if you're not able to do that, just talk to a QS, a registered QS, they can help you come up with a cost estimate or talk to you know, like an elder brother like myself or my former boss, whoever who thinks has done a similar job. They are able to sort of help you put together you know, attach figures to your work. Finally, is you put together a contract that at least the client, the client signs. Let me show you uh, what what a survey layout looks like. Eh? So this is a survey layout. You can see, you know, like I said, it's a curvilinear sort of an office. You enter through here. It had two entrances, a back entry and a front entry. Uh, you know, we, there's existing masonry walls, existing MDF partitions, there's existing gypsum partitions. You know, like, we're just capturing things as they are. There's a ceiling height, height to window, window height, all those things. Uh, we, are, we, are putting them, uh, we are putting them just out there, just capturing a data as it is, plus the photos, plus a video. We normally like just taking videos because photos sometimes you may miss, uh, you may miss some items. Then we created a demolition layout. You see the red one, this one is going to go because you guys wanted to have at least a huge office on this side and another small office on this side. See now, at this point, we know, we know the size. We can straight tell the client, you know, for the things that you want to put together, if you're changing the floor, demolishing, you know, putting a gypsum ceiling, putting new lighting, blah, 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 it's going to come to this, estimate this amount. So once you agree on that, you need to agree on your design fees. That's, that's how now you need to sign the first contract for design fees. Because there's no point of starting going past this stage when the client has not engaged, when they have not signed on the dotted line. Man, this is important. Like this stage is very important. It's the make or break of a project. This is where um, you know whether your client is serious. If that they take things past this stage, then you know this guy is serious. Uh, this is also the time when you, the client gets to assess you, gets to assess the person they are getting into contract with, whether you've captured what they want to, whether they, what, you've captured what they want to put up, whether you've understood their vision, you've best understood, it's called articulation, whether you've articulated their vision well. This is the time where, yani in stage ya kukatiana, this is the time where you, uh, you agree, like, you know, I like this interior designer and the interior designer is happy to work with this client just as by looking at them and by understanding them. And if you don't come to an agreement here, then the project that dies there, like you don't proceed after that. And that's why the quantity of work that you've done for the entire project, actually 10% is, is on the other side. It's normally just like 5%, just gone to site, takes some dimensions, fuel the car maybe one way or two way, whatever. I mean, you can lose it. You get what I mean? Like you've not engaged, uh, you've not engaged. So, but if the client engages at this stage, then you know, we got business, engages and pays a down payment, at least a 10% down payment. Then you know, bro, we got business, we got business, we got business. So now we can unleash our design tools, like the tools we learned in school now, Bam. bring them into the, into the projects. Earlier, we are just like sketching, just talking, you know, like just having coffee, nini, nini. Not, nothing serious, nothing non-committal, yani. But after this, then, then, then there's now the second stage. It's called the schematic stroke, the preliminary design stage. Now your, your design, this is a preliminary point of designing. 
So what are we doing here? Here, we normally do space planning. So space planning is basically uh, deciding which office is going to sit where, next to which office, and next to whoever, next to whenever. I mean, I've gone to places and found the kitchenette is on one end, the bathroom is on another end. And these two, uh, two uh, spaces need to share plumbing lines. So this is, the, this is the place that you need to sort these issues by space planning. And to do space planning, you have to use these tools that we learned in school. Some people think these tools are not important, but the more I practice design, the more I start appreciating the relationship matrix diagram and the bubble diagram. Like Manze, these tools, if you don't know how to use them, please go back and learn how to use these tools. It's the best way to plan a space because it's, it's called a, a relationship matrix. So you have to test the adjacency of spaces by how people relate to each other, how, how spaces relate to each other, who is using the office, who needs to use the boardroom, so which office should we place close to the boardroom, who needs to access the kitchenette, who needs to, you know, all those things, you plan that out on a relationship matrix diagram. After you, after you do this, then it gives you a bubble diagram. If you see here, the size of circle is normally like the size of space you would you would find like the public lounges are given a bigger bubble because they have smaller bubbles attached to it these are smaller offices attached to the big bubble that shows that this this these offices are related to this big space like you can't move to a, a space plan without going through this if you if you go to a space plan straight then you're gonna just make some some mistakes so here um also on the same uh, stage we do you also start the thinking about color and material finishes you also start modeling like now plotting it plotting uh, the space on archicad or autocad or 3d max whatever software you're using and also you are starting now to think about cost seriously because the materials you're putting you know how much they cost when you start talking about carpets and you start talking about marble you know, you know, you know what cost we are talking about. You know, you're raising the cost. So, at this stage, what is expected of you is to do a bubble diagram, uh, a matrix bubble and matrix diagram. Mostly, these ones the client don't understand. So, it's internally for your team at least to understand how the spaces play. But a preliminary space plan, the client is going to understand. So, this is for the client. A mood board. The client is going to understand. I'll show you what what it looks like. Uh, a cost estimate, just a quick quote, or basically even just uh, even just um, just a figure, at least to keep the client rolling. Preliminary FFNE plans, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So this is things like ACs. If you have a fridge, these are now what we call equipment. Furniture. What are the sizes of? mostly uh, furniture that's going to be bought and also furniture that's going to be fabricated. We need to start knowing their sizes at this point. At this point, we are also doing um, small, you know, just preliminary sections and elevations. Not really serious ones, but just preliminary ones, uh, looking like more like sketches. And we are also doing the preliminary 3D images, just to show the client the visual, how it's going to look like. So the percentage, the percentage of work, really, if we quantify, it's like 20% in the, if you look at the entire picture. So, yeah. So if the guy paid 10% down payment, after you present this, they need to give you some 20%. So anyway, um, this is a space plan. We are planning spaces, really. Like, you can see there's a reception area. This is where the director sits. They need to sit next to the principal architect because they, you know, like, the director is more like, the person who is running accounts and everything, principal architect is over there, is the boss, nini, nini. they need to use the boardroom, the clients and everything. And, and now this needs to be connected to now, like where people are working from. It's not a really big office, more or less like even the farm is more or less like the size of my farm really, uh, <clears throat> with the members of staff that they have and the small kitchenette and printing pool, you know, architects print a lot. Um, yeah, so we are sort of like here, this space plan is like showing where people are going to sit and even their furniture sizes. This is 1200 by 600. You know, we know a boardroom is more normal than something like 2500 by 900. You know, like 
we are even like thinking about you know access how is someone gonna pass behind here and then behind here then where is the tv gonna be like for projections in nini if you can see here it's somewhere here there's a water dispenser and so yeah these are we are the preliminary planning stage uh, the other thing you can see is we have started to do some elevations to just show that this partition is going to look like this yeah, yeah just small quick elevations and just saying you know it is a gypsum this is an aluminium you know this is the height this is a door you know just quick quick uh, quick studies whatever these are cabinets these are cabinets reception desk the next you have to present a mood board we have to now set the mood set the tone set the tone for this job like what's going to be the design language are we doing modern are we doing um, classical are we doing traditional are we doing african are we doing afro modern i'm very big on afro modern uh, Af Af because i love modern uh, and also because uh, dr lilac taught me a lot of african 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 <laughs> yeah, so afro modern is is in a, is, is my kind of thing so you can see here we in the mood board we are talking about materials uh, like there's a carpet over there. We are also talking about colors. These were the corporate colors of our client. We are also telling them, you know, like cabinetry. We we want to go in this direction. We are putting in a few sketches here and there to just show uh, how things are going to sit. We are also downloading some images to just get inspiration of how furniture. Uh, you know, we can mix steel and timber to 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 make some really um, modern and but still african uh, sort of uh, furniture recycling and everything all those green design sustainable design we are addressing those so here is where you talk about design philosophy you talk about design uh, the look and feel uh, finishes you talk about color schedules if you can see we have colors here material schedules we are talking about materials furniture you're talking about furniture putting sketches this is where you're sort of like now giving your job some life now after you come from this you need to now now do the actual like you know show them so when i was talking about palettes here are my palettes this is where the color is going your corporate color my kind of my partition the one that had a sketch this is where it is you know like we are now putting the cabinet i was talking about we've already put it behind where you're sitting we have blinds that are in your corporate color. You know, funny enough, this company has the same corporate colors as A Plus Interiors. I, I don't know who stole from who. I believe it's them who copied us. Uh, yeah, so um, this is where, no, like, we're just shooting the spaces as they are. You remember this partition? I showed you a detail of it. So it's not gonna look like that. The carpet, we've applied it. If you remember, I showed you a carpet up there. We've applied it on the, on the principal architect's office and the director's office. This is the sketch of, of, of the elevation again of the partition. You know, blinds again, carpet. This is the boardroom. Yeah. And, you know, another shot like where members of staff are working from. You know, we are proposing to have stickers of their plans on the walls, just to make it look like a dope architectural office. So that's, that's the preliminary design stage. Now, in this stage, uh, in this stage, just know that you're not going to nail things at one go. You're going to revise uh, a lot of things. Like you might stick at this stage for even two, three uh, revisions before you move to the next stage. But before you move to the next stage, please make sure you get paid. Please make sure you get paid uh, for that, for what you have done. Um, otherwise, there's no point of moving to the next stage if, if you've not even voiced and gotten paid for this stage. Uh, design and build is different. We'll address that as, as we go to finish, but this is just like design consultation only. Yeah, so the third stage, we said it's design development. So what, what, what does design development mean? Just as the name suggests, design development. We are developing the design. We are attaching, um, you know, detail onto the design now like we are making we are making these designs um you know they, that they we're making them in such a way that other technicians can understand them like other people that we work with these are now carpenters tilers plumbers we are doing we are touching some some meaning to the design now it's not just art 
it's not just three Ds. It's not just um, you know fancy nice things eh, which are done by students in school. We want to attach some uh, some meaning to this. So what happens in this stage is you refine the interior construction elements and details. So you refine this by going back to you know just sketch again and be sure that this is going to play the way you wanted it to play. Uh, you also start now putting dimensions and and calling out the materials just that i cropped this but we had talked about what material this is going to be but even from the image you can see this is going to be chuma this is going to be our palettes you know we've now started attaching meaning to to material the other thing that happens here is you need to talk to your um electrical engineer if you have one you need to talk to your mechanical engineer you need to talk to your qs so that now we can incorporate the lighting, what you call lighting schedules, oh, sorry, not lighting schedules, what you call their lighting layouts. In, in, this, in design development, you need to have a lighting layout. You need to have an electrical layout. A lighting layout is basically showing where the points of light are going to be on the ceiling. An electrical layout is showing where we're going to have socket switches, everything, consumer units, MC, MCBs, everything. And a data and telecommunication layout is going to show where we will have our CCTV cameras, where we're going to have data like internet and all those things, connection really. So these are services. You need to engage these people who do now services because this drawing set, like the design development drawing set needs to have your drawings and the drawings of these other, uh, other consultants. Then if you cannot do the costs by yourself, this is the time that you know talk to a QS because the design has life, it has dimensions. Anyone can come and measure, it's measurable. Initially it was just art. You and client were understanding it, it was 3Ds and everything. But at least the, these consultants are normally engaged at the beginning. So they know as the design is evolving, but this is the first time that they start delivering something tangible to, on the board. So, from your end, you have your space plans, now refined ones. You have furniture layouts, you have floor finishes layouts, you have wall finishes layouts, you have ceiling finishes layouts, you have reflected ceiling layouts, you have electric, sorry, reflected ceiling layouts is from you, because it, no, no, it's, it's from the, it's from both you and the electrical engineer, because the reflected ceiling layout needs to show also the point of lights. You have electrical and lighting layouts, you have from the electrical engineer, Plumbing and mechanical layouts from the mechanical engineer, data alarm, alarms, access control layouts from the electrical engineer. You have elevations from you, sections from you, details from you, advanced 3Ds and fly throughs. If the client can afford to pay for those, you also put them. This is this stage. It also about 20, 25%, whatever. Sometimes goes even to 30%. Yeah. So you go present this, you invoice. For this fee, uh, sorry, let me show you the, 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 the document, sorry. Uh, we have some elevations here. That's what I mean by elevation. So we have, we have now this, the heights, you know, it has dimensions really. And so like a technical person like a mason or a carpenter can understand now these kind of things. Uh, so my, my refined elevation of that cascade elevation I was showing you is there. So, this is aluminium, this is called 180, 180, this is called 139, this is called frost film. We even put the square meters, one square meter, one square meter, one square meter. This is a door, you know? Like we're just showing these guys everything. This is a reflected ceiling layout. We're telling them to drop the ceiling by 200 and it's 100 thick. We even show it here, you know? We have this detail over here. We're even showing them the angles. It's, it's quite detailed. We are showing them the distance from here, from here, from here, and the angle over here. Like, we've now gotten technical. We've now gotten technical because we are now, we are now uh, com not communicating to the client. We're communicating to our fellow technical people. And most importantly, the people who are going to actualize this job and they need to understand these drawings correctly. This goes to, uh, to the carpenter or goes to, um, most times we go to, the furniture, guys who cut furniture like P.G. Bison, they, you know, a drawing like this will go to them. So, I mean, the dimensions here need to be crisp. You know, like, 
like it needs to be crisp because that's that's how they're going to cut i'll, I'll show you some other um documents that accompany these uh they're called cutting lists really that accompany these drawings as they are going to the factory for cutting and aging and leaping and everything so yeah so that's these are just sample sample um documents that you need to have at the design development pro, pro the design development stage of the design process to be honest with you this is like the heaviest um stage design development because we do drawings like i mean it takes almost two weeks to put together um, a seven bedroom house would take our office of four designers two weeks just everyone just detailing and drawing and pulling lines and putting dimensions and doing elevations and everything a total of around 150 a3s in two weeks so this is a very heavy very heavy stage and man after a heavy stage the paycheck needs to be uh, commensurate so you need to invoice before we go to the next stage yeah so yeah uh, you've gone to the client you've invoiced you've shown your contractors these things and have understood you need now to create go to the next uh, stage it's called construction documentation so we have communicated to the technical people but we now need to communicate to not so technical people these are now the suppliers the people who have hardwares on on on, on whatever on industrial area uh, at the river wherever wherever these materials are bought you know now need to have schedules what we call schedules for them to to, to fill so we in this stage you prepare what you call contract documents so these are schedules more details you also need to um, do specifications you are not doing product specifications so as to facilitate purchases so you, you have to understand that you're the client's representative you're the, you're the person who originated who created the design so you are advising the client that they need this kind of thing this is where they need to get it and if, if they have an alternative source at least they need to have a document that they can send to their alternative source to compare prices okay yeah so in this stage the deliverables from your end will be material schedules will be a furniture schedule will be floor finishes schedule a wall finishes schedule a ceiling finishes schedule lighting schedule tiling schedule sanitary fitting schedule furniture cutting list schedule work schedule okay work schedule is now to show how the work is going to flow and there are also things like door schedules that sometimes we do if the architect had not done it window schedules we also find ourselves doing it um, welding like sometimes we off we are also doing details for railings even gates whatever i mean as long as uh, as long as uh, you're getting paid you're a designer you can put together these things they are not very hard so at least why i put the work schedule here it's normally like the last thing to do but i just put it here because it's the only document that could fit on this cast space over here so after you've done all these materials schedule and everything you have to tell the client by the way tiling is going to take on to take one day gypsum is going to take roughly three days insulation that is now i've talked to the electrical guys they're going to be on site for for two days at least aluminium partition they're going to take about four days you know like we have to break down this thing to 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 achievable goals like the client wants to know when can i move in so our client here was really pressed for time they wanted to move in in two weeks blah 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 of course sometimes these things never happen this one ended up stretching to about three weeks because uh, of course the client changed a few things and also delayed some financing at the point of the project but at least it's good to have a fixed schedule and also for, for everybody on board to be to know what is happening you know you also have to know that you're not working on this project alone you you're working on this project with your other members of staff and your project managers and engineers and whoever they need to have at least something to know at least on the 10th these guys will be doing gypsum so i can come in even if and then i'll, I'll ask them you know like have you have you done uh, the gypsum because i need to come and run my cables you know something like this this helps the team work in coherence and remember as an interior designer you are the leader of the team so you need to make sure that everybody is working uh, coherently 
So some of the documents that... We have like five minutes. Okay, fine. Some of the documents that we have here is things like gypsum schedules, like this is what you use to go and buy gypsum. We have uh, wall finishes schedules. Uh, uh, we have tiling schedules. These are now like schedules. This is a cutting cutting list. Uh, it's a PG Bison cutting list. Um, what else? Yeah. So that's that stage is done. Now we go to the real real work. Eh? This is construction administration. This is a this is um, my friend's favorite part, Mr. Levy. This is now when like if you're if you're the consultant, then you will be doing periodic site visits to make sure that work is going according to drawing and to make sure that people are following. Um, and also that there are changes that happen on site really. If this was designed and built, then you have to supervise this thing through and through. You have to be the one buying materials, blah, blah, blah. Like it's really tasking. So what is expected of you here is at least to have site, to have minutes. Whenever you have a site meeting, please just have minutes. And, and what we call, um, you know, people who are going to deliver these things, like like assign, assign people some things that uh, we need to tile one floor and so-and-so is going to do it, do it. Progress reports and things we call snagging lists. Snagging lists is the small things that have been forgotten that need to be fixed. Yeah, so this is construction administration. It's very simple. It's just managing the construction till the end. And then at the end, you have a final product. So these are pictures of, of this project that we did that took three weeks, my friend, instead of two weeks. So it's an architect's office. Uh, you, you remember this sketch somewhere? Uh, you remember you remember this, 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 this wall somewhere in my, in my drawings? Um, you remember this partition? Uh, yeah. Of course, you remember this one. Um, that's the office. Of course, you remember this crazy cabinet in this in the CEO's office. And boom, we are done. Go invoice for the final payments. Get paid. Thank God. Go home. Thank you very much. Yeah. Back back to you, uh, Michael. Um, Sam. Moderator, Sam. As we wait for Sam, uh, I, I look forward to discussing about how to charge for design, at least with other professionals, so that people can know. So that I can just keep measuring, you get paid, you get paid, you get paid. We need to, to sort of also know how we come about uh, these charges. Yep. Thank uh, you very thank much. Thank you very much, uh, Charles Chetty. I'm still waiting for Sam. Sam, are you with us? Uh, as we wait for Sam to come in, uh, if you have any questions, you can send it through our chat uh, so that we can uh, give you a chance to ask a question or you can direct the question also to other designers um, in the house concerning the design process. Sam? Sam? Let's continue. I think we've lost him. All right. Um, anybody with a question? Or comment? Okay, let me direct a, a question to Julia. Julia, are you, are you with us? Um, and also note that George Oviso also has a question. Oh, George, you saw that question. Yes. Okay, um, George, can you okay. unmute yourself and ask? Okay, my name is George. Uh, I'm a student. Okay, what I wanted to ask is that um, in uh, designing this uh, layout, when uh, coming up with a um, plan, so example like, um, lightening layout electrical uh, engineer can come up with his or her own uh, layout if you're a designer also the same so my question is is it that uh, 
uh, like plumbing, electrical, data, interior designer has to do all these together, or uh, or uh, like plumbing, uh, plumber knows his own, uh, can do his own layout, then you uh, you just comment on it, then you, uh, the process yeah. began. The designer also did the same. So my question is, is it that uh, uh, like plumbing, electrical, Thanks, uh, thanks, George. Can, can I respond, Mike? Yes, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Ah, fantastic. George, thanks for this. Um, first of all, is um, as an interior designer, you will not do a plumbing layout. That's not your work. But you will have made provisions for places, things like sink. Uh, you get what I mean? Like in your layout, you will say that this is a kitchen. I need the sink here. So what you sent to the mechanical engineer is just the dimensions of where you want your sink. Then they are going to do their layouts. They're going to figure out how to bring water to where your sink is. Okay. You're the one to say where you want the things because you're the interior designer. You're the one who did space planning. Same to lighting. You're the one to say that I need... I need uh, light here, and I would love a chandelier at least in the middle. Then I would love to have maybe four lights around around the space, and maybe a hidden light. Then they will advise if four lights is too many, if depending on the wattage and everything. From there, they, are, they can they will come up with a layout, but at least you will have given a guidance. So yesterday I, I was on site with an electrical engineer, and. We were just comparing notes. Like he's looking at what I provided and he's looking at what he is provided to just match, to ensure that what I want to have, because at the end of the day, as an interior designer, it is your responsibility for the appearance and the aesthetics, aesthetics of your space and the lighting. It's your responsibility to create lighting. But the, these engineers are enablers. They enable you have water, they enable you have power. Because for you to light, he's going to figure out how to do the cabling from the consumer units. You don't care how the, the cabling came there. But he's going to provide those ways, tell the people to hack nini nini. Same to sockets. If someone is seated, like if you see in the image that I've casted, someone is seated here, they need light, they need the power. So the interior design, the engineer will see that I have done a four, four desk workstation. So my, my responsibility is to provide dimensions of where my desk is going to be. Then the electrical engineer is going to figure out how many sockets to bring me there, how many PowerPoints, how many data points, how many voice. We didn't talk about voice because you need to make phone calls in an office. They bring all the points from there. After they start, they see this is where you're having four guys. So it's, they use your layout as a guiding layout to to do their own layout. So you don't have to do the layouts yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, is from uh, Winnie Murundi. Sorry, mm -hmm. Chair, welcome back. Uh, we are taking questions. Um, Winnie, she's asking uh, about costing. According to your presentation, you charge after each stage. So what about clients who want to know the whole budget before beginning the design process? Charles? Yeah, uh, Mike, thank you very much. William Murungi, thank you very much. Um, the, this, the, the budget is discussed at the beginning. You, you discuss the budget at the beginning. So why we are charging after every stage is we have broken it down. So you have an initial budget. The client knows it's going to take me X amount, but I'm going to pay you in stages. After you deliver this, I pay you. After you deliver this, I pay you. After you deliver this stage, I pay you. That also protects you from a client to die and want to pay. If you agree on a, on, a, on a full figure, and then you go and do everything, and then you come with everything, and then the client tells you, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> 
what will you do? <laughs> yeah, so it's also to protect both parties, really. There's a final thing that's agreed, but we've broken down into small stages. 10%, 20%, at least so that if the relationship goes sour somewhere in between the process, at least you've got some money. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and then another question from uh, Bona Uiti. What is the future of space design? now that many are transitioning online. Charles? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Owiti. It's, it's, it's Mona, Mona. Bona. Bona. Okay, thanks, uh, Owiti. Owiti. Thank you very much. You know, the future of space design, as you understand it, is the same way I do. People are not going to need as big a spaces as they needed before. As you said, you articulated it very well. People are transitioning to working from home. Yeah, the future of space, let's just say the spaces are going to get smaller. Let's just say that because people need addresses, like businesses need an address. Uh, we are just uh, probably going to have a reception area, a boardroom for people to meet. And maybe a few workstations in, in, in the boss's office. The spaces are going to get smaller. It's the same thing I was discussing with my colleague. We don't need banking calls now that we have gone to online banking. We just need the bank as an institution. But banking walls are on their way out. Same to huge offices. They are on their way out. Actually, I read an article <laughs> uh, from from the New York Times um, yeah, saying that uh, the office space is, is on its deathbed. So, yeah, you're right. The open plan of office space, new space spaces are on their way out. But in terms of address, businesses will still need an address. So they will still need our services, probably in a smaller scale. Yep. Okay. But now, you need to know that homes now, homes are going to be the big thing. So, just business as usual for us. Offices are shut, we design homes. Ukazi, man. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, the topic about the design process, it's not only applicable in um, interior design, so allow me to deviate a bit to graphics, see if they follow the same process. In just a few comments. Esther, are you with us? Esther Nyongesa? Yes, sorry. Yeah, um, I, just, I just wanted to ask, is the design process similar of what uh, Charles has presented in terms of graphics uh, or uh, communication I, design? Yeah, I would say in some way they are closely related. Uh, yeah, maybe except the costing, that's where things are totally different. And then the different st stages in interior design they are not similar to graphic design yeah but the the process is much more the same can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah so uh, i think what i i would just say for graphics it's more about starting with the concept which is quite similar to interior and then if you are you have to decide on the the route you are support you are going to take do you want it simple do you want it big and loud depending on your audience so those are the things you need to consider are you going to talk to someone who is illiterate how do i how do i approach that am i going to talk to someone am i trying to communicate to someone who is well exposed what kind of details or elements will i use in my design that is if it's at work. If it's a personal project also, it also, it depends with the extensiveness of the work, how big the project is. Is it a booklet? Is it a flyer? So I would say for the graphic co or communication design, it's a little bit different from what Charles has shared. Yeah, even the costing is not the same because yeah, you can't break it into smaller elements. It works as a whole, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Esther. Um, Esther, she's a graphic designer. 
I'll move to product design. Julia, are you with us? Julia, come with Hello, Mike. Hi. Can you hear me? Is, I can hear you clearly. Yes, I'm here. Uh, is the design process similar in product design or, or what is different in your area of, or field? Well, the basics are the same, only that in terms of product design, we tend to have a lot of iterations especially when the client gets to see a certain product and they get to tell you that make a few changes because we actually work with first getting a prototype unlike in interior where you're working with a final piece. So you actually get to first do a prototype, for example, show the client a few changes are made. So you iterate, make the changes, get back to the client again. So if you're geared towards doing mass production, then you work with a prototype that has been approved. So yes, there are some similarities and also some differences that you get to see in terms of the process. Okay, thank you, Julia. Julia, don't go off. I'll okay. give you a question from Bona Witi. Okay. What happens when your expenditure exceeds uh, your costing? Uh, is that, is the question geared, whose expenditure? The clients or the person who's producing? Uh, I, I think she's referring to the production. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you cost... Sorry? I'm saying if... Um, I think she's referring to when you do a quote and yes. in production it goes over. Most likely you will not have it going over because you'll have agreed on the materials that you're working with. And then you, and as, Ch had, as Chetty had said, you have to have really done your homework and you have to have, be very sure about costs because that is not something that can be taught to you in school, for example. So you have to have uh, certain aspects or elements in terms of cost at your fingertips, knowing, and that's why you have to have, uh, when you're working with your rough estimate cost, you have to know it has a give or take to either go up or down. Uh, so when you're going back to the client in terms of production, they will have to know that uh, I have an option of one, two, three, and this is the cost friction for this, 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 and always give alternatives. So if you find your production has, your production cost have, has gone overboard, go back to the client, speak about other alternatives that then would be within the budget. But you have to be very, very careful, especially when you're working with costs from the very beginning, so that you're able. Sorry, somebody said something. No, just continue. Oh, okay. So you have to have you have to have at least options of this is within your budget. If this can go either with costs, but also when you're working in real time, it's good to know costs at the at your fingertips so that you're not going at a loss having having had agreement with your client in terms of what they want so when it comes to production you will not have prices that are too up again it's also in terms of like product design in terms of time for example you could be working on a sample and you get materials that you're using at this moment, at this price, but then the next batch that comes in, maybe when you're doing your production, prices have gone up. Again, the only human way is to go back to your clients and explain. But if you're working within real time where your, your prototype is being produced not too long from production, most likely the cost will stay the same. I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'll ask the last question and then I'll, uh, I'll uh, take it back to Malaki, the moderator. Uh, this is to you, Charles. Uh, it's actually Malaki asking, uh, have you ever had an issue with a client and uh, have you ever handled it legally? Uh, thanks. Uh, Mike, can I respond? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, th thank you. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Maraki, I would say that 
issues are always there. Um, I think I've never failed to have an issue. I think that's, that's how it should be. I've never done a project that didn't have uh, a pull and push and pull issue. Uh, most of these issues are settled um, diplomatically. It's only one, 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 one project that not even the client, but a supplier uh, threatened to sue me. Yeah, but they never sued, so it's okay. Uh, I'd lined up my lawyers, my battery of lawyers to defend me, <laughs> but it never happened, so I'm still waiting. I hear it's a rite of passage for people who want to become billionaires, so I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Malaki. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Charles, uh, for that um, comprehensive and awesome presentation. As far as the, the design process is concerned, you've done well. And uh, personally, I've learned, as I mentioned, when we are, I was making my introductory remark that uh, learning is an everyday experience. I've learned from your presentation. And whatever information has come in is quite, quite awesome. And um, given that you still have time, I'd like to would like us to take more questions. And as I wait for more questions to come in, um, just back to Charles. Um, uh, in the design process, uh, assuming that you're having an issue with the time limits, have you ever skipped any of the design processes or uh, everything has to, be, has to go as uh, scheduled? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Sam, for that question. Uh, I think um, time li we are always having an issue with time limits. Uh, I have never seen a project in Kenya where uh, people are not pressed for time. In, in some projects, uh, it depends. It, just as I say it depends. It depends on whether it's a design and build job or it's uh, you are a design consultant. But if you are a design consultant, you are just being paid for for designing, really. So you have to follow the process, whether there are time constraints or not. And even just currently, the project I'm handling, the client is constrained in terms of time. He called me late on site after he had even had an electrician. But I told him, you know what? But brother, if you want a good thing, you gotta follow the process. If you if you want a shambolic job, uh, we might as well just say goodbye to each other today, <laughs> because I, I don't want to get into something that is already broken. Uh, yeah, so uh, exactly. So yeah, so the process has to be followed if 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 it's uh, if it's design uh, consultation if it's design and build we can fast track some things we can fast track some things like instead of we can fast track some things if if the person has decided to engage us on design and build it means that they're still paying the design fees really but they want these things immediately so what happens is you just reduce the time that you would take to, for, for instance, you will still do the, so, so let's just say that you just have to follow the process, but now press yourself in terms of time. Do the mood boards quickly, do the ninis, like quick, 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 like maybe even in three days, so that at least you can have a layout can, that can go to site. And then these other documents, you can be following them up, like now elevations, after the guy has tiled, now, but it's, it's normally a lot of pressure, really, uh, to, to the team that is working on, on the project. But sometimes we do some things for money. Uh, honestly, I'm working my way to stopping doing stuff for money, but just doing things because they need to be done right. But you have to make a compromise anyway. So let's see, let's see. Yeah. You have to be smart and make it work within, within, within a short schedule. But... No skipping of stage, no skipping of stages, no skipping of stages. Everything is important. Yeah. Malaki? Thank you, Charles, for that. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I I'd like okay. to open it up. I would like to open it up to a member to ask a direct question to Charles. Um, any member arise? Just raise your hand up. I can see Jojo Wiso. It yes, literally is his hand. Yes, Jojo Wiso, ask a direct question to Charles. Okay, maybe to ask. I've uh, I've had a chance to work with as an intern in a interior design field, and uh, I've seen in. Um, in case of a, a design disagreement with a client, an interior designer and a client, so I was asking, uh, um, like, uh, uh, which kind of, uh, like, which people do uh, interior designer and a client involve in, uh, for them to come up with a like um, a good solution, uh, so that there will be no uh, an issue after. So just uh, like engineers lawyers which people are the best uh, to um, to bring uh, on a site for the solution case thanks uh george Owiso. uh this is a very important question and it's very important because i've never i've never gone to that route but i know if we are in this business we might find ourselves going to that route there are people called arbitrators. There's a chartered, there's a chartered um, institute of arbitrators, registered arbitrators in our country, who are registered to arbitrate construction disputes. And these are normally uh, architects who have trained as arbitrators. Even you, an interior designer, can train as an arbitrator to arbitrate matters interior design when people have had longer heads. We also have QSS who train as arbitrators. We also have lawyers who train as arbitrators. Arbitration is just bringing two warring parties together and it's a skill and it's trainable and you have to have a certificate for you to arbitrate. Yep. Anyway, we normally just arbitrate if you took Uskizana. <laughs> but if 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 push comes to shove, like if there's a lot of money on the line, then you have to look for an arbitrator. Thanks, George. Thank you for that. Any other question? There's a question from Facebook. Yes, Kay. The, it asks, what is the link between technology and design? and also design and pandemics like we're having at the moment what is the link that's for me yes please yes, yes. or any other designer and maybe you answer and then we throw it to Dactari also yeah i think uh, <laughs> let's let me just answer in the best way i can pandemic Let's start with the link between technology and design. Uh, design has influenced technology a great deal and vice versa. Technology has also influenced design a great deal. One of the things, the tools that I use to uh, take dimensions on site is, is an invention of technology. I think I have it here. It's a laser, a laser, uh, <laughs> a laser, this thing. Eh? I mean, this is technology influencing design. <laughs> it's a link because uh, 10 years, when I was starting the business, we were using a steel tape. Yeah. And to take dimensions on the site, used to, it was a whole day job. But is it just yesterday? On Tuesday, I was on a site just for one hour. And I took dimensions of a seven bedroom house just using this small thing. So it's it, it in many ways, the link between design and technology is in many ways. And you know very well that the people who are in technology, who are influencing technology are also designers, product designers. You know, you know um, the, the Apple, Apple's product designer, uh, I'm forgetting his name, um, yeah, I, I'll get the name and, and, and shoot it to you. He's, he's a guy who 
who, who came up with Apple IMAX? Uh, it's called Ivy. Uh, yeah. Jonathan Eve. Yeah, Jonathan, yeah, Johnny, Johnny Ivy. Jonathan Ivy. Yeah. Jonathan Ive. Eh? Thanks, thanks, one boy. I can see you. Uh, you know, inf designers have influenced technology a great deal. A lot of the people who are the forefront of technology are also designers, product designers. And uh, game, gaming, gaming, gaming is, you know, like a, a, a virtual reality thing and that my friend Melissa does. So, I mean, there are designers in technology, a big deal. How pandemic, how, how, pan, how pandemic is going to shape design in the future? We've discussed this a lot in several forums. Um, uh, Madam Wambu and Mike Muya know that uh, it, it's going to change the way we design, really, because we need to now um, give a lot of space to living spaces are going to change because people are going to live more indoors. Uh, the way we entertain guests is also going to change. I remember one boy telling us about the front porch. We are going to, to see the return of the front porch where you entertain guests without them coming into the house because of social distancing, really. Someone is dropping a gazette, whatever, they come over there, the front porch, drop it over there, vamos. We are going to have um, the, a, a, a big, big importance of the back garden. Like, not the back garden is going to be the kids' play area. You are going to need a back garden, a private back garden. So, so we are going to see a lot of... Um, changes in terms of the way people live and also now the home office is going to become a thing you know like when if, if you do residentials like i do this forms 50 percent of what we do you, you realize that the home office is normally not considered as it's normally the kids study area that's actually what people have been considering and then the owner of the home puts like a desk over there you get what i mean like i have a desk here when my kids are starting i don't use it that much now home offices are going to be a big thing because people need to work without their kids interrupting them. So study, study room and home office are going to be two separate rooms. The other thing we are going to see is an upsurge of home gyms. I'm a member of a gym that, bro, for the last, I don't know how long, I've not been to the gym. I don't know whether I'm going to get a refund of my cash, but if I had the gym in my house, you know what, get what I mean? <laughs> Barber shops, <laughs> man. I've been shaving myself at home, Bana. So anyway, we are going to have salons, yeah. home salons, and proper home offices. You know, it's, it's, it's a big, big thing, and many, many other things that members of this forum can, can bring on board. Thank, thank you, Charles, for that. Uh, I'd like to, re to request Dr. 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 Are you there? Dr. Yeah. Yes, I'm there. Yeah, uh, pl please weigh in on the question asked and also weigh in on the, the design process from Katie's uh, presentation in the next maybe two minutes. Thank you. We seem to have lost Dr. Her audio has gone off. Uh, as we wait for Dr. Uh, Charles, and uh, uh, one more question. Um, um, I know with the COVID-19, uh, a number of things have changed. Uh, you've done many projects. How have been the projects you've done before and after COVID-19 affected you as a company or as a consultant? Uh, I would say that uh, business stopped at a point. That was in April. But in, in May, we were back on the road, man. <laughs> man, man must eat. <laughs> man must live and live abundantly. So, I mean, we were back on the road in May and things have started picking up. I would say uh, the difference is we are having more homes. I haven't seen anyone come. The only office that someone called us to do was to just introduce partitions in between so that when people want to come, 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 home, come, come back to work, there will be social distancing. Just glass partitions. Uh, like, like, like a, 
Marcel and this forum said <laughs> it's like offices are on their way out. And it's actually true. They are on their deathbed. So so I don't think if if someone had specialized in doing offices, they're going to have uh, I don't know, I'm not a prophet of doom, but the business is going to dip a bit. Oh yeah, we have one office in the offing, but that shall be done. They're just doing planning. Actualization is going to be done towards the end of the year. And it's not something they thought today. It's something they have they planned way long ago. So I think mindsets have changed of, of, of top manager. And also because there's no enough cash flow, there's no uh, a lot of money to spare in terms of refurbishing and renovating and rebranding. We are going to see, you know, a slow... Um, a slow development on that end. But as I said, homes are, you know, people are, have now started loving themselves. As the Bible says, in the last days, people shall be lovers of themselves. Okay. <laughs> so they are doing their houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's good business, man, for, for, for all of us, you know. Let's do homes as we wait for offices to pick up or clinics and whatever. We haven't even seen, we've seen one hospital asking, you know, they want to do expansions. So it's small, small restaurants, bro, no work. I've not been called to do a restaurant uh, since COVID started. Yeah. Or hotel, you know, hotels are closed. So boop. we chill, we chill, we wait and see. But as we wait, we do homes. Yeah, can I come oh. back in? Yes, yes, yeah. doctor. Now you, you're clear. Continue. The, that, you, see the, you see what technology is doing to me now? Huh? It just yes. decides that I've, I've talked enough. <laughs> before, before it decides to do the same again, I want to say this to designers. Technology is not supposed to replace creativity. Creativity is creativity and you use technology to fast track or to accelerate the in prototyping or in uh, changing mi minor adjustments and manipulation. But the designers need to focus on their creativity so that technology can be, be used to uh, manipulate whatever their ideas are. Ma many times we're seeing a lot, not a lot, some designers use technology at the expense of their you need to invest in your creativity. On the pandem pandemic um, and design, what I've seen is that it has given uh, opportunity for a lot of creativity and new products. I have personally seen uh, textile prints which have come out of the COVID. I've seen a lot of art and artwork uh, coming out of COVID. I'm waiting for the furniture to come in so that we can see this array of new products and services which have come out of the pandemic. It has given, it has forced a mind shift and I think now we are comfortable with it. By the time I'm not hiring to get out of the house, thrive, and the designers should do that, should make use of that. Thank you. Dr still on that, what is the future of design process in the next 10, 20 years? Dagari? The design process is going to be accelerated. Process will rated. But that training designers, it means that we have to focus on the pre-design process. As um Katie was alluding to let's have our our own let's have our, have our culture let's know our africanness and quickly translate this into products and services that people can use the design process is going to be collapsed into a very short um time after the pre-design phase that's my view okay. so we have to change the curriculum Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ari, for your insight and uh, contribution to us at today's discussion. 
maybe I'll just like to one our audience, uh, a student. Do we have a student in the house who wants to ask a question, the last question before we wind up? Student in the uh, in the meeting. There was yes, a question yes. from one of yes, the George. students about how to, what advice is there for students as they transition into the workspace? Thank you for that. And uh, so that uh, uh, we can be able to answer all the questions. Also, George Owiso, I've seen your hand up. Ask a question, then we'll weigh in all, uh, we'll weigh in the one that you've done. Uh, basically, that was the question that I posted. <laughs> okay, thank you for that question. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mike, can you respond to that being a teacher, uh, first hand information? <laughs> um, a tip to students who are going um, into the industry design is wide you have to, to have a, a broad mindset when you, when you are transitioning into the industry as you have seen the in Charles presentation it involves a lot of things and uh, some of those things are not covered in your curriculum some of you are even, uh, never even, never ever there in your curriculum. We usually give the design process, the definitions, but the actual uh, implementation uh, is learned in the, in the industry. And I would like to tell them they should not be afraid of um, getting mentors like Charles Chetty, like Malaki Sam, that uh, they can walk behind uh, those already in the industry to understand uh, some of the uh, uh, areas or approaches that is being used in the industry. And um, yeah, basically I can say that, that they need to uh, have a wide mindset. They need to um, teach themselves, right? You know, uh, in, the, in their college or whatever, Sometimes it's not covered. So you have to teach yourself, you have to interact with people like plumbers, electricians, um, even just asking or consulting with them. It will give you the insight that you need uh, when you're entering the industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for having um, weighed in. Um, uh, it's uh, 3.30 and uh, being designers, we are cognizant of the fact that uh, we need to observe time. And I know many are them that really want to ask um, many questions as far as this session is concerned. We, this conversation can, still, can always continue even after this session. Let's keep interacting even on our Facebook page, on our WhatsApp page. Any question that you think that is uh, relevant to be asked or to be addressed as far as design process is concerned, this is actually the platform we can be able to use so that you can be able to have this particular conversation ongoing even after the meeting. But of great observation and concern, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Charles Ketty, the CEO of A Plus Interiors, who has sacrificed his time to be with us, who has sacrificed his time even to weigh in on matters of design processes. Thank you so much, Mr. Charles Ketty. We really appreciate you as our member. We really appreciate you as a member to many students. We really appreciate you as a guru in as far as the interior design is concerned. And I hope the members have been able to learn a lot from this particular session. And of course, this is not the end of it. You can continue even, um, con even uh, discussing or um, asking Charles more questions even on his private uh, Facebook page and of course, even on his private uh, WhatsApp page. Until next time, I think um, we've, done, we've done well. Thank you for the members also who took their time to join in. Those ones who've contributed as far as this particular discussion is concerned. Let's keep design on the road. Let's keep design on the move. Let's talk design, let's read design, let's practice design, let's engage in matters concerned design because that is what we've trained to be. Of course, doctors have been trained in their line, designers have been trained in our line. Let's keep to our line and let's influence even matters design and as far as everything design is concerned. So thank you so much for having been there during this particular session. We've been a number of us, others have been coming in and joining, but as a, the Chairman Design Kenya Society, it's my pleasure to actually congratulate you for having taken time to be with us. As I mentioned earlier on, these are fortnight meetings, and of course in the next two meetings, in the next two weeks, we'll be having another session like this so that you can be able to keep matters design 
uh, the on the road and matter design being discussed in each and any forum that you are in. But uh, until then, 